Um, I'm kind of the designated poetess, I guess. Um, poetess. That's what it's officially called in the dictionary. Ooh. Anyway, um, it's been something the Lord has blessed me with pretty much since the day I was saved. I wrote a little bit before then, but never so much as I did after. And never with so much joy and peace. And um, anyway, so I was uh, looking through um, my poems, my existing ones, um, and trying to find something that kind of goes with the theme. And uh, Tom told me that it's uh, basically how the enemy of our souls, Satan, uh, discourages us. And my first thought was, oh man, <laughs> <I'm not laughs> there's, so many, there's so <laughs> many ways you can try and do it, but you know, um, and, and my first, you know, my first overall thinking was, okay, this is one of the components of the spiritual battle that we're in. It's all a spiritual battle, and if you get discouraged, in my view, it means that you've lost or maybe never quite gotten figured out or settle down in your soul what your identity in Christ is. And if that happens, then you're kind of like <laughs> just lost out there waving in the wind. And uh, so you have to know who you are in Christ and the things that you have because you're a believer in him. And you have a lot. <laughs> because he is powerful and he can do many wonderful, wonderful things that you can't even imagine yeah. or think of at all. And so... I uh, wrote a, a new poem today, um, this afternoon, and um, I initially just called it spiritual battle, but then I thought, okay, there's other things that we're battling the enemy about. There's, you know, pride and anger and, and all these other things. But tonight's focus is more on discouragement, and so that's what this poem is based on. It's basically, so I... I, I I put colon discernment, you know, discouragement on the end, you know, uh, just to kind of clarify uh, this one. But anyway, so without further ado, this is the poem I wrote this afternoon. From the moment we've been born again, trusting Jesus as our Lord and King, we enter into a spiritual battle that totally changes everything. Toward, toward the new targets on our backs, the enemy aims each flaming arrow. To discourage using doubt and fear, hoping we'll ditch the straight and narrow. Fierce wars raging daily in our minds, our emotions and thoughts under fire. But God's, by God's strength, we fight the good fight, overcome, and even inspire. Satan rides, saying we're not enough. Identity crushed and worth lost. But in Christ Jesus, we're made complete. For us, we lovingly pay the cost. There's no condemnation in the Lord, for we've been redeemed and set free, sealed as citizens of heaven, where he's prepared a place for you and me. The enemy really wants us to forget God is with us, behind and before, that whenever fear comes knocking, we can just send Jesus to the door. <laughs> Greater is he who is inside us than the lion that seeks to devour. Even things meant for evil of, uh, works out for our good each hour. There's grace and mercy in times of need, in battle when push comes to shove. Remember, there is no power at all, at all that can separate you from God's love. So when the enemy comes at you, pointing out flaws and where you came from, simply remind him where he's going and that the battle's already been won. Amen. 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 Thanks for spending your Sunday night with us. Um, I do want to talk about discouragement, and I, I, I'm going to go a little bit different than uh, what Dean was doing, which is absolutely right, and we'll tie those things together. Uh, I'll be honest, I get discouraged. There are times when I'm, I'm doing my ministry work, and uh, you're just not seeing any fruit, or you're just not, or, or you're, you're just not getting anywhere. You feel you're going backwards instead of forwards, right? You see in the Bible, David gets discouraged. He's crying out to God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? What is going on here, right? You, you see times when people get discouraged in Scripture. And, and I would tell you that um, we're going to talk tonight about how Satan takes advantage of that. 
So I want to go through a couple pieces of scripture, a couple verses, and then really dive into our personal lives for application tonight. So Peter does tell us that Satan prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know that. Well, this is how Peter knows this. Back when he was hanging out with Jesus, hanging out, Jesus says, uh, Simon, Simon, you have, that's Peter. Behold, Satan has desired to have you, so that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that you will have faith. So there's a scene where, where he's telling Peter, hey, look, Satan wants you. Now think about Peter for a second. Peter was this guy that was, was always kind of very brash, didn't think before he did things, right? At one point, Jesus is telling the disciples he's going to go to the cross and he has to have to bear all this stuff. And, and Peter goes, hey, Jesus, come Shh, don't tell the guys that you're discouraging them. And then Jesus retorts about this one, get thee behind me, Satan. You have things of the world on your mind, not things of heaven. Peter was the guy who's like, I'll always be with you, Jesus, no matter what. We know how that worked out. Um, <laughs> You know, Peter was this really bold guy. Matter of fact, Pete, I love this scene when, when uh, uh, the women come from the tomb and they tell the disciples, he's gone. John screams out the door and Peter must be a bigger guy because he can't keep up. <laughs> but they're all hiding in the upper room, all cowering. Right? So Peter's this guy that, that Jesus has said, Satan's trying to sift you. And later in his own writings, after he has the revelation of the Holy Spirit, right? He says, hey, Satan's prowling around trying to get you. But I want to examine that for a second because I think that sometimes we get it wrong. I love C.S. Lewis. He said, there's two things we get wrong about Satan. Either we give it way too much credit or not enough. And, and, and right in the middle where it is. So I want to go through this because um, Scripture tells us, it says, don't, don't be unaware of his schemes, right? <coughs> but also, I think we don't have to be afraid. You know, as Christ followers, there's nothing to fear about this type of thing. Uh, but there certainly is a battle going on. By the way, I love her hair. It's just the most fabulous hair I've ever seen. That is, that is like shampoo commercial hair. Johnson & Johnson baby shampoo hair. Press. It's great. So let's take a look at these two verses. Lions prowl. Lions prowl. They sneak up on. Think about lions. Have you ever seen a National Geographic show? Yeah. They're prowling. They're sneaking up on their prey. They're quiet. The poor little antelope doesn't know what's going on. It's licking there. And all of a sudden, here's something. Looks around. <laughs> Tiger stops. Aaron Black stops. All these predator cats are right. You, you watch your cat kind of sneak up on. The cats are cats. And, and they're waiting until you're vulnerable. They're waiting. For that moment where you're unaware. They're waiting for that moment to pounce, not when you're ready to fight them. You, you never really see a lion go, hey, let's go after the hyena. It sees us. You, you, you see the lion prowling and waiting, and that poor antelope doesn't look up in the water. Next thing you know, it, it pounces on them. So when you think about Satan prowling around like a lion, understand what he's doing. He's just kind of watching it. He's, he knows a lot about you because he's just watching. He's recovering. He's, 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 he's stalking you. <coughs> and he's waiting for that moment when you're vulnerable. When your head's down. You're not, when you're not doing the right things. And then he's going to strike. But not until. Because lions don't strike their prey when the prey is aware. Okay. I've watched these National Geographic things. I'm fascinated by them. And yeah, I'm always rooting, go, little antelope, go. Um, <laughs> if, the antelope gets, if the antelope gets a little start, yeah. lion will catch it. Because they're fast, and God made it so those guys can get away. The second one, be sifted like wheat. What does that mean? Well, if you think about like first century, uh, they, they would grow wheat, and they would they would first they thrash it. There was a threshing hall. They take these sticks and beat the wheat, and they would separate the chaff and the wheat. Then they would pick it up in these, in these little sifters. And do this. Now, how many of you are old enough to remember your 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 family or your mom's or your grandma's sifter? Flower seed. Yeah. Remember that thing? Yeah, they still have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great. Uh, that was my job. <sighs> Make something. And, and and you don't know what you're doing. You're like, oh, this is stupid, but okay. I mean, it seems like it's thin enough for me. But you're you're sifting out the stuff. You're getting it thinner. Now, what if, what if, what if you think of if someone's going to sift you? They're going to grind you up. 
Yeah. It's a grind, right? Yeah. It is Drinking just, soup. yeah, it's just, you're going to be just ground to nothing. And it's not just physically, it could be emotionally. It could be mentally, it could be spiritually. You ever been so exhausted and so tired and so drained, oh, yeah. you're just ground to the just ground up. I think everybody is tired of being tired all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we get this image of, of Satan prowling around, looking for you to be unaware, to be vulnerable. And then when he gets you, he's gonna sift you. He's just gonna grind you up. And that's what Satan's doing. Because that's what scripture says. Okay? So the, the goal of Satan is really simple. I mean, this, this isn't complicated. His job is to keep you away from God, to separate you from God, and keep you from doing what God wants you to do. And that way he gets to hang out with you for eternity in hell. Yay, him. That's his job. Now, unfortunately, we get really blinded by him sometimes, though. And I want to tell you why. It's this discouragement piece. When you get discouraged, exactly what Medina says happens. You forget who you are in Christ. You forget who, whose image in which you are made. You forget these things because the grind is so brutal that we get focused on the grind itself and not the bigger picture. So what I want to do is have you understand what he's doing, what Satan's doing, where he's prowling, what he's looking for. How are you vulnerable? Oh, I'm vulnerable. You know, what does that look like? And, and, and how we can make sure he doesn't pounce on us. I don't want to be that poor, dumb antelope licking the water and not knowing what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know the worst one I saw in that National Geographic? The poor little antelope licking the water, and then an alligator comes out of the water and grabs the thing. I'm like, that's not even fair. <laughs> <laughs> that antelope had not a shot, because how does the antelope know there's an alligator? At least you can hear the lion. Yeah, there's, there's some nasty stuff in nature. So what type of things are happening in your life that are opportunities for you to be vulnerable to Satan. There's a whole list, like Lydia said. So let's go through them. Negative self-talk. How many have negative self-talk in your head? The things you hear are all negative. Now, it's really important to understand something here. Satan didn't create that. The devil didn't make you do it. Satan doesn't have that kind of power. There's nothing he creates. There's nothing that he's doing that causes things. But he, he, he doesn't do that. God is sovereign. We'll go through that piece at the end because this is the, the that's the, 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 the great finish of this thing. But you have to understand that when you have negative self-talk, he will take advantage of that. You may say to yourself, yeah, I'm being real stupid right now. And then you'll hear him go, yeah, you are. <laughs> or you'll say, that person can't possibly love me. Oh, yeah, you're super unlovable. Right? Oh. God, Satan will just get in there and start fanning your own negative thoughts. Now, those thoughts are coming from you for whatever reason, right? But he just starts going, oh, yeah, you're right about that. And he'll just support you to, to the nth degree, to the point where you're spiraling yeah. about how worthless, how bad, how whatever you are, you are. Now, he didn't create that. That came from your head. But he's certainly watching. He's prowling around. And when you have negative self-talk in your head all the time, you're not just li- drinking water from the pool. Your head is underwater. <laughs> you can't hear the lion coming. And he just pounces you and just grinds you. Now, how many of you, just be honest, uh, don't show hands if you don't want to, but have had such negative self-talk that it's gotten you a place where you have no self-worth? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> That's Satan. See, it's one thing to have negative thoughts about yourself, have negative experiences in life, have trauma, have whatever's happened to you, and struggle. It's another thing to go, and I'm completely worthless. That's where Satan gets you. Because when you're worthless, then God can't even love you. And when God can't even love you, you can't love yourself. Because the scripture says that you've got to love others by loving yourself first, right? You can't do that. So you can't love others. I can't love God. I can't possibly love this mess. And Satan's going, yeah, you're right about that. Well, you are a mess. Negative self-talk is a great place for Satan to prowl and look to hammer you, right? How about this? Anybody have any unreconciled relationships, any unforgiveness going one way or the other? Mm -hmm. (laughs) They call it divorce. Yeah, Yeah, unreconciled. What does scripture say? Do you remember? It says, forgive 70 times 7. No matter what anybody's done to you, always forgive them. Uh, The forgiveness you're giving somewhere is between you and God, not between you and them. Because unforgiveness is a cancer. But Satan 
wants to give you that cancer. He wants you to wallow in that unforgiveness and be bitter and be unhappy and, and think that there's no justice in the world. That person's not getting what they deserve. And I'm, my life is sucking and their life is perfect. And I just... That keeps you away from God a little bit, doesn't it? I think a lot of it, too, is, is forgiving yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that took me a long time to finally get to that yeah. point. Mm -hmm. Forgiving myself for what it is. I say there's four areas of forgiveness. You forgiving somebody, allowing forgiveness back to you, right? Someone asks you for forgiveness, you give it. Forgiving yourself, it's a huge one. Mm -hmm. And forgiving God. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're mad at God. I've been mad at God. David was mad at God. Sometimes you gotta go, oh yeah. I forgive. But Satan's job is to find out where you have unreconciled relationships, get right in the middle of them. And tell you you're you're right. Right? So it's always saying you're mad at somebody. Instead of going, hey, you're right to be mad at them. They're good. Hey, did you wrong? You should be really upset. No, you shouldn't forgive them. What they did is unforgivable. Holy mackerel. And it makes us forget that, that God forgave the worst in us, so we should probably be able to forgive somebody else, right? Yeah. But Satan tries to get in our way. And this is a place he prowls around like crazy, unreconciled relationships. And he tries to make you live in that dark, dank place of bitterness against people. Right? And I'll be honest with you, the only person suffering is you. The other person doesn't give a crap what you think. Yeah. And so if you're upset, the relationship's not working out, and you've not forgiven, and you're just mad, what do they care? Mm -hmm. All it's doing is making you unhappy, and God doesn't want you to be unhappy. You're made in his image. He has plans for you, all this stuff I always preach about. But Satan wants you to be unhappy. Because the more unhappy you are, the less you believe in God's promises, the less you believe in God. The less you believe in what's going to happen, the less hope you have, the more hopeless you are, the spiral goes down the tube. That's a great place he promised. How about, anybody have a hard heart or had a hard heart? I did. What I mean by that is you don't love people. My experience growing up was people were bad. People would take advantage of you. People would humiliate you. People would hurt you. People would do anything they could do to you to oppress you. Right. So I grew up going, people are jerks. And I'll be the center of the universe. And I don't love anybody, more or less trust them. And uh, I will have acquaintances. But I, will have, I have friends. Right? I had a very hard heart. And the person you see in front of you is an absolute freaking miracle. Because if you knew me back in the day versus who I am today, you would say, there is no way that guy could be this guy. Because I care deeply about people now. But it had to take a, you know, Scripture says, I'll take your heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. That actually happened. It was stunning. You should have seen how judgmental and how much I made fun of everybody. I was really equal opportunity that way. But I just hated people. And my wife would always say, but you like them individually. I said, one on one, okay, but as a group, yeah. But God changed me. He made me love his people. But Satan doesn't want you to love anybody, right? Because God says, remember Jesus says, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love, love God and love each other. Well, if I don't love anybody else, am I truly being a Christ follower? No. Didn't, didn't, didn't the word say, uh, if, if, the, if you don't love your brother, the love of Jesus is not in you? John writes that. So one of the ways he tries to, to keep us in, in bondage, to keep us away from, from God, how he prowls, he looks for your hard heart. Are you hardened somewhere? Are you not trusting? Do you not like people? Are you going to fight with somebody? How can I take advantage of that? And what he says to you is this. <clears throat> You're crazy if you trust that person. You're just going to get hurt again. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And we have all sorts of sayings about this stuff, right? And Satan is trying to keep you in this place where you cannot realize God's love. Because you don't love others. And remember what Jesus says. If you judge others, it will be judged to you the same way. If you don't forgive others, my Father won't forgive you. Do you see the pattern? How you act is how it's going to be to you. If you don't love other people, guess what? How can God really give you the blessings that you deserve and have earned and, and he wants to give you if you're just, like, hard-hearted? 
Now, the other thing you do is look in here and look up in the back of your Bible's hard heart. How many people had hard hearts and what he did to them? Never went well for them. Pharaoh's the first guy that comes to mind, right? But this is another place that Satan prowls and looks to sift you. How many of you have ever had an unmet expectation? You know what we call that my, my, my house for me? Tuesday. Because I have expectations that are really unrealistic. And I've been trying really hard, uh, just to share a little my personal life, to lower my expectations. Lower, 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 lower. I have to be nothing, and Jesus has to be everything. Mm -hmm. And the more expectations I put in place in my work, in, of myself, of my wife, of my friends, of my church, of my pastor, the more expectations I have, the more disappointed <coughs> I'm probably going to be, right? Yeah. Yeah. But what does Satan do? You deserve that. Yeah. See, Satan's not always mean. Matter of fact, you, you read scripture, he's like the, the archangel, he was light, he was happy. He's not gonna, he's not gonna scare you. Woo. He's, he's gonna come in and tell you things you, you want. You, you deserve that. You should have that expectation. Boy, that person's really just not really doing it for you. And he undercuts relationship. He undercuts and makes you feel like you're not getting what you deserve, right? And it's hard because there's a half truth there. Maybe the expectation's not out of line, but the half truth is what you deserve. Anytime you say you deserve something, you're like. Ooh, that's a bad word because what I'm saying is God's not enough. Anytime I think I need something other than Jesus, I'm saying something else is more than Je Jesus isn't enough. I need that 4K TV. The 75 inch one, please. <laughs> <laughs> so unmet expectations is a great place for Satan problems. Here's another one. Anybody lonely? Oh, yeah. Loneliness is a breeding ground. For Satan. You ever watch that National Geographic? And it's so sad. You, you see the, 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 the lions isolating the one young little Kathy thing. And, and you're like, no, Kathy, don't leave the mom. And, and, and they get him, and, and, and yeah, it doesn't go well. Anytime you get isolated, Satan gets you. It's just like the hunt. If you can pull one out of the herd, the herd will go off, and, and there's no protection anymore because there's protection in numbers, but there's no protection for the individual. So if you get isolated and you get lonely, let's say you have depression and you tend to isolate and withdraw and not be involved with people and not be around your sisters in Christ and not be around your pastors, not be around the church, not be around people who can support you, not be around your friends, not be around encouragers, guess what's going to happen to you? You will be sifted. Period. Because you can't outrun Satan when you're alone. That's why scripture says we're to meet. We're to be together. We're supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ. We're supposed to be like First Corinthians 12. We're supposed to be different parts of the body and leveraging each other. We have to work together. Fellowship. Fellowship. Even when Jesus sent them out, he sent them out two by two. Right? All of that is so you don't get isolated, cut from the pack. Now, I've met Christians who have been cut from the pack, and then they don't seem to follow their faith much anymore. Once I can cut someone from the pack and pull them into the world, your faith wanes. Right? And that is absolutely the enemy. And, and, and it's not, this isn't rocket science. What well, he does. He'll attack your low self-esteem. He doesn't create your low self-esteem. Some things in your life create that, right? Circumstances. But he'll take advantage of your low self-esteem. He'll drive you into the ground. Anybody have a critical spirit? I have a critical spirit. What, what that means is uh, you're very judgmental. Boy, that's a hard one. Right? And doesn't it seem like there's always someone to be critical of all the time in front of you? It's like, how is that? How can there be so many people in front of me that need to be uh, chastised? <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how come there's always somebody in front of me that needs to be made fun of? I don't understand this. Well, Satan is, 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 is fanning that flame of it. Of inconsiderateness and unkindness and judgmentalness and that 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 kind of stuff in you. There's a there's a uh, young guy I, I mentor, that young 33, and for a class project he's getting his associates at Chenecada. They wanted him to do an autobiography and they wanted me to tell three good things about him and three bad things about him. And I told him the bad things. And part of it was he can be really unkind. 
Um, he's not thoughtful about other people. He, he can do that way. And I got done telling him the bad things, and he laughed. He goes, you're right. <laughs> I'm like, we should be happy about that. Um, <laughs> critical spirit. He's got a critical spirit. And we're told here, not take offense. We're told here, you know, let, it, let, let it roll off you. But instead, that critical spirit, and that's where Satan comes in, and he separates you from God and the things of God by making you even more critical. You ever notice when you're in a bad mood, it gets worse? Right. You ever notice when you're not connected to God as like you should be, it gets worse? Right. Right? Well, duh. I mean, this is that big duh moment, right? How about ignoring your spiritual disciplines? You don't go to church. You don't get around other Christians for fellowship. You don't read your Bible. You don't pray. And then you wonder why your life is a crap sandwich. <laughs> Well, if you're not going to pray, talk to God, and you're not going to be around people that can encourage you, and you're not going to be reading his word a little bit, I don't mean, I don't mean like read a zillion pages a night, but read a little bit, and if you're not going to be at church and hear a sermon or do whatever, you're not going to do those type of things, <coughs> then whose influence are you taking? Yeah. Who do you think is influencing your mind? Yeah. If it's not the church, there's only one other source. You know, if you really think about it, this game is really simple. There's good and there's evil. Choose one. That's where Jeremiah said, me, for me and my house, we'll be, we'll be following the Lord. How about you? You can do what you want, but I'm following the Lord. He made it really simple. I spent Second Timothy today and there was a part where he made it all clear. If you're not in the Word, I mean, you're very vulnerable, especially it was something about women. I can't remember what exactly it said. It was very vulnerable. Very vulnerable. Where it came from. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So you can have other insecurities, relational insecurity. Financial insecurity, um, not seeing the results of your actions, the, the actions of others that really fire you up. All these things are meant, well, let me rephrase that, all of these things are opportunities for Satan to drive a wedge between you and Jesus. Okay? Now, we have a sin nature. Right? Even though that we're, we're born again and we're a new creation in Christ, and, and all these great things, and we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we still have a spiritual battle inside ourselves every day between our flesh and our spirit. And our sin nature wants to come out and do all this stuff. Well, who's fanning the fire of your sin nature, do you think? Maybe. Yeah. Absolutely. He's prowling around, just waiting. Yeah. Waiting for you to make the mistake. Put your head down. <coughs> Didn't Jesus say, keep your eyes on heavenly things, not worldly things? You've got to die to yourself, pick up your cross daily, all those great things he said. The moment you stick your head down and start worrying about worldly things, Satan's got you. That's when he pounces. Bam! He gets you. Right? Anytime that, that you're running from him, but you're trying to use worldly ways to run from him, <laughs> he's going to catch you and grind you. Right? So, uh, I, I have this example. I have to talk to this young woman I, I mentor. Um, She's got this great thing going on, but there's, there's some money things in her head. And she's right, but she's wrong. Because the money things are okay, it's great. You know, money's money, quite low. But you've got to be careful not to make that the object of what you're doing, because once you make money your thing, you know what will happen? This is what will happen, actually. Satan will give you more of it. More money, more problems, right? Yeah, right. Right? And what happens is you become kind of painted into a corner. Because all of a sudden you think you deserve that, or all of a sudden you think you need that, and all of a sudden you're, you're dependent upon it. What's the only thing we're supposed to be dependent upon? God. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing we're supposed to be dependent upon. I'm not dependent on Lisa. She's not dependent on me. We're dependent on Jesus. That's what makes this whole thing work. But if you become dependent on worldly stuff, affirmation, friendship, relationship, Stay away from the boys. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. Money, power, title, influence, prestige, anything of the world. That's why John said you're supposed to hate the world and everything in it. When you become dependent upon those things instead of dependent upon God, you're going to get what you get. And all of those things Satan will use against you. Every one of them. So you can see there's a ton more things, right? There's a line of, uh, that threads through this that, again, Satan didn't cause these things. He doesn't have that power. Satan only has the power to do whatever God allows him to do. 
And this is the most important thing I need to say. Understand that God is sovereign. Nothing happens on this earth. You're not going through anything that he's not allowing. So it can always be well with your soul because nothing's going on that he doesn't know about. He's not like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's happening to her. We've got to get down there. <laughs> that's not what's happening. He's like, yeah, you'll, you'll get through this. So long as you keep your focus on me and you do what I want you to do. You, you don't do what I want you to do. You want to follow any of these kind of things. Well, okay, you'll suffer your consequences. But if, as long as you hang out of me, you'll be fine. Right? So what do you do about this? A couple, three things real quick. You know God is sovereign. <clears throat> Trust that for goodness sakes. Two, you need to pray. Mm -hmm. Jesus says to Peter, Satan wants to sift you, but I pray for you. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's good enough for Jesus to pray about it, it's good enough for me to pray about it, right? And pray for each other. Anybody here being sifted right now? You don't have to raise your hand. Uh, uh, but if you got a, somebody in here you know is being sifted, pray for them. Get around them. Right? When you're in a vulnerable position, expect the attack. Right? If you have to drink the water in the pond, keep your eyes up and ears up. Get a buddy to watch your six. Because Satan's coming. Right? Sometimes we need to be vulnerable and drink the water. That doesn't mean I, I don't have Lisa watching my, my backside when I'm be vulnerable. That's part of the, the brother and sisterhood of Christ is we watch out for each other. Right. And when I see you getting attacked, I jump right in there and help you out. We don't just go, hey, look at the train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> and then lastly, this is so, so important. All of us have vulnerabilities, right? Where, where Satan can, you know, I just gave you a short list. All of us have vulnerabilities where Satan can come in and drive a wedge between you and Jesus. You gotta work on your vulnerabilities. Okay? So if I'm vulnerable in self-esteem issues, i got to work on believing that I'm truly a child of God. And that's good enough. And that when I die, the only person I'm meeting is Jesus. And that's who I'm judged by, not anybody else. And I'm okay with that. If I have issues with depression, great. I'm going to get the mental help I need. I'm not just going to sit around and wallow in it and then say, I don't like doctors or I don't like medication. Well, all good things come from, from God and Satan's going to abuse you badly if you've got something you're not treating. Trust me. Woo! Trust me. Um, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You have an opportunity and that vulnerability to do something about it. Because scripture says that God always gives you a way out. But you have to love each other enough and care about each other enough sometimes to intervene and say, Sister, there's something we got to do together. Got to get some help. Right? Lisa and I in our relationship are all about that. We're, we, we, our iron is sharpens iron. We're always helping each other get better and reach our potential. We intervene with each other a lot because we care. Because we're not just married, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And we give each other permission to do that. Well, the, 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 the Christian family, we give each other permission to speak in each other's lives. And if I see someone being attacked by Satan, because he's prowling around you, and I feel it, I see it. You're making dumb decisions. You're hanging with the wrong crowd. You're starting to put your head under the water. You're not getting protected. You're getting called from the curb. I see these things. Man, do I jump in and fight for you. And I'll be honest, sometimes I'm told, get out of here. Okay, I hope you like lions. <laughs> Didn't work out for the Christians in the first century too well. When the Christians and lions game, they win. Yeah, yeah. Just understand that you don't have to be scared of Satan prowling. Yes. You have complete authority and control over that by how you act, by relying on Jesus, by keeping your head up on a swivel, because it is a war, and relying on each other, being in the herd, being in the fellowship, being in the brotherhood, sisterhood of Christ, in the family. And when you are attacked, don't be surprised. <coughs> Fight back. Because we're allowed to review Satan anywhere he comes. Mm -hmm. All right. I hope you have a fabulous, uplifting Sunday night. Thank you. <laughs> ready for another week? Thank you. I'll bet I'll bless you my Lord.